you know, despite all that stuff of being a kid, I loved Doctor Who when I was a kid, and then you reach an age when you get involved in sex and drugs and rock and roll and you move on and you sort of, you know, you have a life. Uh, I mean, let's just say I spent a lot of time drinking. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of time drinking and eating curries uh, and getting very confused. Because I think Violent Pink is a good name for a band. Yeah. Peter Capaldi's band. I would say <laughs> a, less, a less good name. What was your band called? Uh, the Dream Boys. <laughs> <laughs> this was at a time before the Chippendales and, 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 and things like that. And remember, we were all just kids at art school, so we thought we were being very sort of uh, Kafka-esque and arty and dark. But of course, people didn't think that. They thought they were booking a bunch of guys to come up and <gasps> take yeah. their clothes off, which uh, we, we, we didn't do, but we would if, if, if people paid us. <laughs> Actually, before that, we were called... Uh, our first name was uh, The Bastards From Hell, <laughs> which was more appropriate to the punk ethos that we were cleaving to. <laughs> what punk rock band were you in with Craig Ferguson, my old friend Craig Ferguson? Yeah. Uh, well, Craig and I were in a band, uh, I don't think I can say the original name because it was so uh, rude, mm -hmm. uh, but Craig showed up one day. I was, uh, we had the worst band name ever. It was called the Dream Boys. This was in the days before Chippendales or anything like that, but we didn't Dream think we Boys. were... Dream uh, Boys? Yeah, I can't even listen to it because it's so awful. Uh, but we thought we were sort of nightmarish and all of that stuff. Uh, but anyway, Craig came to be our drummer. He was like 18 years old. Uh, and he lived, we were uh, in Glasgow, which is a kind of industrial, a big industrial town in Scotland, and he lived in a satellite town. He used to work in a post office. Can you believe this? He joined a punk band, and we would be out all night. Was you he know, drinking then? I, yeah. Yes, that's safe to well, say. He talked about that. Yeah, well, we all were, you know, we were all young, and uh, we were having great fun. But I used to laugh because he used to have to get back to the post office every morning. <laughs> be behind the counter at the post office. Was that the when the, the age of the Stones and Duran no, Duran? No, no, that was post that. This was more like the Sex Pistols and that kind of thing. What was he like then, Craig? He Gold. was funny. I mean, that was the thing that really struck me about F Craig right from the start. He was. I always said to him when he sort of became a comic, I said, you know, you're a natural. You know, some people become comics. They learn how to be a comic. They get gag writers or they put an act together and stuff. But he was always, he would make me laugh just in the room. You know, just stuff that we would go through and things that would happen. Uh, and he was an absolute natural. Oh, uh, yeah. And so Great was, guy, too. Yeah, yeah. So it was so right for him to do. Several years ago, I met with concept artist Ian McKay. And he said he went to art school with you in yeah. Glasgow and that he'd give you his first acting gig in Frankenstein. <laughs> As well as a band called the Dream Boys. Yeah. Is this true and do you still draw? Yeah, how do you know Ian? Um, I was picking up some uh, commissions from him, so I had some art that I was buying from him. So Ian is, um, what, how would you describe Ian's position? What is he? So, so, so he, he, he designed Darth Maul. He designed Darth Maul. He's an artist who works in film. Today, and he's designed a lot of things for Star Wars and for other films, for Marvel as well. Okay, so he's one of the top uh, designers, uh, and particularly for, for George Lucas and for Star Wars and stuff like that. Yeah, uh, we were all at an art school together in Glasgow, uh, in windswept Glasgow. And Ian used to always, I always remember, Ian would have been past his desk and he'd be like drawing a monster or a spaceship, and I remember one of the teachers said to him, you'll never get anywhere before you draw it. <laughs> spaceships and monsters, and look at him now. Um, yeah, no, he wanted to, he decided to run the dramatic, there was a dramatic society at the art school, so he became the, the, the chief of that, and he decided to do a production of Frankenstein. So he cast me as Dr. Frankenstein. <laughs> Even then, it's just astonishing. So it was clear he was going to do big things. Me, less so. <laughs> I'm a huge fan of uh, Local Hero. It's my favorite movie. Um, and I've been, I watch it almost every year. My husband and I have been to the town where it was filmed. And I just wondered if you could 
give us an anecdote or a memory or something about filming that movie? I did. Um, it was uh, the very first day we filmed. We filmed with, uh, I, I, fought, I was 23, uh, and I was on a beach with Bob Lancaster, who was, uh, to those who may not know him, is one of the all-time great Hollywood movie stars. Uh, and I was standing on the beach with him, and we were doing this scene, and it was uh, supposed to be a balmy Scottish uh, evening, uh, and it was snowing. <laughs> this is the <coughs> it's snowing. I'm like, well, I'm Scott. Uh, and if you watch the film, because we filmed his scenes at the start, although they don't really show up till the end of the film, uh, the, the director said, just wait, 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 wait. And by, and by the afternoon, he had cleared. But if you look at, uh, in the scenes at the end of the film, and you look in, on the mountains, in the uh, islands, uh, just beyond the rise, they're all covered in snow. <laughs> so that's your clue there. Yeah. But um, it was great fun, good fun to do. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering if there's ever a celebrity that either of you have met that caused you to like really freak out and be really excited. <laughs> well, when I was a, a kid, I met uh, the, uh, this wonderful actor who was recently recreated uh, in the Star Wars movie uh, called Peter Cushing. <laughs> he was brought back to life through computer magic uh, in Rogue One. Uh, and, but he was a very famous uh, horror movie star in the UK, and he used to play uh, Dr. Van Helsing. He was, yes, uh, he was the real Dr. Van Helsing, the only Dr. Van Helsing uh, who defeated uh, Dragon. I met him when I was a kid. Uh, and that was a uh, really exciting and I got his autograph and in fact his autograph is because we share the same initials uh, and he's Peter Cushing and I'm Peter Capaldi and so I copied him. I turned my signature into his. <laughs> so if you have my autograph, it's a little echo from Dr. Van Helsing. Oh, wow. Or the grand... The grand talking. Um, I haven't met Beyonce yet, so um, <laughs> I'm, I'm still waiting. It's, it's going to happen. <laughs> D I don't. I would freak out. <laughs> you would? You would just lose it? Absolutely. Just, yeah. I'd be gone. <laughs> now it's got to happen. It just has to happen. Someone in here knows someone. The modeling. I so don't understand the modeling. So yeah. this picture, I saw oh. some of it. I kind of, that one, I mean, awful as it is, it sort of makes sense. This next one, was the cameraman <laughs> blind? What, what, like, that is no, well, that's, that's, and that's something that isn't a pose at all. I know, and why can't I even put my elbow on the, on the, on the, on, on the stool? Something's going on there. That's just being an idiot. That's just being, you don't know anything. You know, I don't know. Nobody gives you a book to say this is how you become an actor, this is what you do. You're just an idiot, you know, drinking lager and having curry, and people say, but did now you send, you're an actor. Did you send those pictures out to people? No, they were nothing to do with me. That was a, it, was, it, was a, it was a popular daily newspaper. Oh, so they were published? Yes. <laughs> I assume that was you trying to be a mo no, no, they were, no, they were published. They were published. Obviously, I was a, a style icon. <laughs> Remember the first girl you kissed? Um, yeah. What was her name? Um, Elaine. Was this in London? Uh, it was in Scotland. Oh, are you Scottish? Yeah. You ever know what happened to Elaine? Uh, I married her. You're kidding. And I'm not kidding, no. You married the first girl you kissed? Yeah. How old were you when you kissed her? Uh, well, perhaps I'm missing out some, uh, uh, some, uh, 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 some teenage uh, uh, kisses in there. But uh, 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 23. So you were very serious with her quickly. Yeah. Yeah. No, we were, very, we, we were not serious. We, were, we had a lot of fun. Oh. That's, why, <laughs> that's why we got married. Because then we still have so much fun. She's here with me today. It's great. What's your most cherished memory? Uh, getting married. You really love this girl. I do, yeah. There is a British school of theatre, isn't it? 
very different from the American school. I think so, yeah. I think it seems to be more uh, text-driven, I guess. It comes from a sort of Shakespearean tradition and all that. But, but I have to say that that's not really where I come from. You know, I really come from more of the, you know, you know Craig. So uh, <laughs> we come from a more uh, improvised, if you like, um, uh, rock kind of comic art sort of background as opposed to the more schooled, you know, Royal Academy of Dramatic Art sort of uh, actors, uh, you know, I think I've just sort of found my way through it all and found myself uh, becoming an actor as opposed to setting off specifically with that ambition. What I wanted to ask is, I know Doctor Who is your dream job, but every actor goes out for roles that for one reason or another they don't get. What was the one that you really, really wish you had, maybe you were their second choice for and just didn't get it? Oh, you know, that changes from, uh, it depends upon what your financial situation is. Because <laughs> sometimes you might be like, I'd really like to play Hamlet, and they don't give you Hamlet, or uh, sometimes you're like, we don't have any money to buy food or pay the rent, so you really want to do anything. <laughs> then. So there's been lots of parts that were like, you know, the, the detective's friend, uh, <laughs> or the, the, the third banana, which I would have loved to have got because I needed the money at the time, but I didn't. What has been the most difficult part about your rise in the industry? Um, I think the most difficult part is just hanging on in there. You know, things, it's great, you know, we come on shows like this when things are going well, but nobody does a show when they interview actors for whom it's not going so well. And then for most actors, that's, you know, that happens. So I've had my ups and my downs, uh, and so I'm keeping, a whole, keeping the, 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 the sort of dream alive when uh, the, the, there's no Larry King show or, or, or no Doctor Who, that's, that's, the, that's the tougher thing. And also when you've got a family too, and you have to pay the mortgage, you know? Even all the famous actors that I've known, Henry Fonda told me, when an actor doesn't see a script, he's nervous. Yeah, 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 it's true. Like, have they forgotten me? Yeah, and sometimes they do. <laughs> <laughs> when, when you're in a creative funk, whether it's for acting, writing, music, whatever, what do you do to get out of, to find your motivation, I guess? Uh, I, I, when we were in a creative what? Funk? Like, a creative what? Creative funk, funk writer's like, block, uh, writer's oh, artistic block, sure. actor's <laughs> block, whatever. I take a rest, <laughs> I have a nap, I go for a walk. Uh, I think you have to learn that, uh, that you've got to stop sometimes. I mean, I think just applying, applying pressure all the time, just, just working and working and working, can be uh, a case of diminishing returns. I think you've got to recognize when it's time to stop, and walk away, uh, and free your mind do something else, listen to music, go for a walk, look at some pictures, just watch TV, eat things that are full of calories. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I think then it sort of loosens your mind up and you can start having ideas again. Because it gets very, very depressing when you're confronting that wall. Uh, sometimes, and it depends upon the project or, or, or what you're doing, sometimes you gotta just keep hammering against that wall. Uh, and sometimes you break through, but your own instinct will tell you whether that's happening or not. Yeah. Um, I agree. Um, just to doing something actually completely opposite, um, to take your mind out so you can come back fresh, otherwise you just stop being able to, to see or come up with new ideas in, in any fashion. So I also go for a walk. Um, or uh, just, again, just try and get caught out of like the zone that you're in and to come back into it. It's super cool that you sometimes draw pictures for your fans. Does your artistic ability, drawing and photography, influence your performance as an actor? Well, I think it's, uh, it's all from the same seam, you know. I think it too, I, I had a, 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 I used to always get really freaked out because I didn't go to drama college. So I didn't, no one sat me down and said, 
here's a script, this is how you work out what you're going to do. I never, no one ever taught me how to do it. So I would have to pick it up on the job and listen to other actors and hear what they had to say. And I always felt uptight about the fact that I didn't have that training. But I knew I could draw and I knew I could look at pictures and, 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 and sort of have a relationship with them. And, and I knew that I was feeling an emotion. Uh, so I, I, I saw another actor who one day came into work and they had artists' pictures all over their script. And I, thought, and I said, what are you doing? And they said, well, I, I have an emotional response to all of these artists' pictures, so I'm putting them in my script where, where there's an emotional uh, bit in the script. So I suddenly thought, oh, well, I can do that. I can do that big time because I've spent my, ta my, my life relating to pictures. I've forgotten the question. That was a great long <laughs> drawn out answer. No, do you question. ever use that? You ever answer the question? Yeah, yeah, I you do. You do use I it. I do, yeah. Is, is, is there a specific acting... Um, like guru or teacher that you point to as your inspiration, or? <laughs> I mean. An acting guru, you're, you're taking me very seriously here as an actor. I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm never really been asked about acting, which is a, 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 a consequence of, of the nature of my kind of acting. Uh, the, um, uh, I think I've always been very, you know, I was brought up, I'm a big fan of horror movies and Doctor Who and stuff like that. And I was always a great fan of Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee and all of these guys and all of the doctors. And I think even as a child, they probably fed into uh, the way I uh, performed in the playground or whatever. So uh, I was always very taken with their great ability to bring truth and sincerity to material that was sometimes not the best. So I think that's kind of what, what, what our job is, 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 to, is to bring truth to anything. Oi! <laughs> I'm a young actor trying to get more involved in the industry. Um, so really my question is, what kind of things, you know, like how do you prepare for the role, especially a role with um, so much history to it and such a richness to the character? Uh, just the same way as you would for any other role. You know, you figure out the story, I mean, that's really what, what acting is, 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 is telling the story, uh, uh, figuring out what your role is in that, uh, learning your lines. <laughs> you know, it <laughs> sounds really dreary and dull, but I really truly believe that the, the, the key to a lot of really good acting is just learning your lines, because that then frees you um, to tell other stories. Um, and thinking, thinking about how you would like to do this, how you would like to play this scene, play this part, and then being prepared to abandon all of that. <laughs> just being able to walk in with, uh, with a degree of preparation and then just forgetting it all uh, and seeing what unfolds, because that will inevitably be more interesting than anything I've thought of uh, at home on my own. Since you brought this kind of rock and roll essence with you with the doctor with your guitar and your sunglasses and stuff, I have a question about from yourself that we have Dylan. And from Scotland, you have Donovan. I'm personally a fan of Donovan, but it's like the Beatles and the Stones or Donovan and Dylan. I need you to choose between Donovan or Dylan. They're tough here in you can Minneapolis. Do it. It's not a trick question. So you're, you're treading sacred ground. Don't think so. They call me Man of Yellow. That's right. And Dylan is Lord of the Wind. Oh. Uh, I, with all due respect to uh, Donovan, who I think is fantastic, who I've met, and it's lovely, it comes from Glasgow. Exactly. This is where I come from. So, how fantastic to do what he did. You haven't been to Glasgow. Not yet. Right, well, to do what I've he met did. Donovan. Okay, well, for Donovan to do what he did. Uh, coming from where we come from, where, you know, that, that's totally new stuff, it's amazing. But Bob Dylan is just right. astonishing. He's, yeah. he's just incredible, so uh, I love him. I, I don't want to choose between them. <laughs> I'm sure they're both nice guys, but uh, the one that I listen to more is Dylan. Thank you. About Frobisher, dear God, <laughs> How did you feel when you read the script about that character, and what was, I guess, your impression of the friend reaction um, to his very reprehensible but 
sadly still kind of understandable choice at the end. Because I sobbed like a three-year-old for a good hour after that episode. Well, I thought it was great. I mean, it was, uh, uh, I, I was surprised at how powerful it was. I was surprised at the effect that it had on people and how popular it was. And they, they ran it in the UK, they ran it over five nights. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was all a surprise to me that it was going to be taken so uh, seriously, which was right that it was. Uh, and it's down to uh, the, the, the talent of the team, of Russell T. Davis, and all of those people, that, that they, they could do a show like that with a character of such uh, complexity. I thought it was really sad, but I thought, you know, this is, uh, I, I love when uh, sci-fi or fantasy shows are able to reflect some of the complexity of the real world, and in a way, this was a man who was locked into a position with no hope, he had no other choice than the choice he had to make to protect his family, uh, which, you know, is awful, uh, and, and sadly, in, in the world today, there are people who, who are faced with choices like that. Uh, so uh, it, was, uh, I, I, it, was a, it was a privilege to do it, and I'm glad you liked it so much. Thank you. How are things in Great Britain? Things are fine. I mean, I don't, I think uh, uh, with the new government we have, uh, the organisation that makes our show, the BBC, uh, which is a great, one of the great organisations of the world, oh. the most special, special organisations, I think it's uh, under threat. I think it's seriously under threat. And from? I think from the government. Funding? Yeah, and for its very existence, and I think it's... Why? Because I think, I think the government doesn't think that the BBC supports it. So I think it's, uh, would like to... You mean because it does programs that attack the government? Because, yeah. Sort of like PBS has been accused of in America. I think because it is not answerable to shareholders and it uh, entertains ideas, all kinds of ideas, uh, about uh, Britain and about history and about the world and about art that I think the government would rather not... They don't want to pay for it. And, and I think it's so important. I'm glad you asked me that question because I think it's one of the most important things that is happening in the country. Uh, and, the, and the BBC represents um, the spirit of our country. Is the citizens aware of this? Uh, they should be aware of it. And that's, you know, why I'm saying this to you, because it is so important that people don't let this magnificent thing vanish. It could vanish? I think it, it, is, it, it is that dangerous, yeah. You played Malcolm Tucker in the BBC series The Thick of It, right? Yeah. Now, that made fun of the government, didn't it? Yeah. That's what we're allowed to do. It's a BBC program. We're allowed to do that. We're allowed to make fun of the government. We're allowed to, to really give the government a hard time. You were, you were, you know, in The Thick of It. Yeah, yeah. As Malcolm Tucker, you were yeah. quite sweary and quite yes, out yeah, there. Yeah. Yeah. So, do you have to be very careful meeting people in the street now? Yes, of course, yes, because Doctor Who doesn't... I, I, I played a character who was a spin doctor for the, for the, for the Prime Minister um, who uh, swore all the time uh, and really used very, very, very rich the language. Worst. Yes, the worst. the worst sort of language. Mm. But fans of the show would come up to me in the street and say, swear at me, please, please swear at me. <laughs> uh, so I'd have to stand in the street and abuse them with the worst possible language. I'd sign their autographs and say, get lost, go and get a life, stand up. <laughs> to be able to do that with people in the street. <laughs> it was great fun. <laughs> you could. I could. I'd get in trouble. But now, do you have to be squeaky yes. clean? Well, I'm squeaky clean. Are you contractually obliged not to swear at people in the street? No, no, I can swear at my own time, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> on my own entertainment. But uh, I haven't sworn for about uh, two years now. <laughs> I said I don't believe you. Personally, I like you very much as the doctor, but I like you even more as Malcolm Tucker on the sick bed. Uh, Malcolm's uh, 
cussiness. Uh, but he certainly way he could say anything he liked. Uh, and uh, the worst thing really was I used to practice it at home. I'd get, <laughs> you know, I'd get the lines that what, and I still got to work in the kitchen. I always, I always end up doing learning the same with Doctor Who. I learn my lines in the kitchen. So I'd pace up and down the kitchen learning his lines, getting louder and louder and louder and more rude. Uh, and I'm sure the neighbours must have got really upset. But the worst thing was if my family, I'd be, I'd get my, build myself into a state of absolutely horrendous mild cruelty and evilness and nastiness. And someone would call downstairs and say, have you seen the remote control? I'd be like, ah! <laughs> So we got Malcolm, we had to put Malcolm in a box, and we don't really, <laughs> not a blue box. <laughs> Maybe the best elephant cursor I've ever met. Thank you. And for forget of life. <laughs> um, so, everything I've seen with you as yourself, you seem like a very warm, gentle person, and I'm wondering. <laughs> uh, if there's a particular place that as an actor you draw from to play these irascible, angry, unpredictable. <laughs> Well, I have a very good friend who said, uh, everybody thinks you're really nice. <laughs> she said, I know that the real you is closer to uh, those other characters. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? <laughs> That's not true. Um, I think you just, uh, I think you draw upon age. I think that, you know, I got very lucky. I mean, I, I sort of became more successful the older I got. And I think that, that, that was sort of the way it works for some people because I had sort of more to draw on. The more that life had kind of beat me up a little bit, <laughs> the more that things had gone wrong and that I, I'd, I'd struggled a bit. I think that made me uh, more, uh, I had more stuff to play with then. Uh, so I think I draw upon uh, the frustrations that, uh, that, that uh, having a, a sometimes complicated life can give you, but I think everybody has that. I don't think I'm a particularly unpleasant person. <laughs> but I'm quite good at pretending to be unpleasant. You're very good, that's not <laughs> Thank you. I'm very good at pretending to be unpleasant. Before who came into your life, and you've been in a few permutations, you worked up to, there was the Torchwood, there was this, there was that, and then before he became Doctor yeah. Who. Um, but one of uh, your best known performances, and one that I absolutely loved as a true Bulgarian, was Malcolm in, oh, in the yeah. thick of it. Yeah, yeah, in the thick of it, yeah, So yeah. I remember when they announced that, I was like, oh my God, we're gonna get the first Doctor Who who curses a blue streak. Yeah, yeah, I haven't sworn for like four years. Because of that? Since I became Doctor Who, I thought it was very inappropriate, but hey, I just left. So now Peter. I can really curse. You can I do it now? No, you do, can I, I do my first no, post? Really Please! Really oh Christmas. my God! Give it up Christmas, for him! Let him curse, now. ladies and gentlemen! Bring back Malcolm Tucker just for a moment! The moment Jody comes on screen, you're allowed to swear again. <laughs> Not until then. <laughs> I've still got, I'm on on Christmas Day, so yeah. I can't once. On Boxing Day, you'll hear me. Yeah. <laughs> I'll call you. I'll call you. Please, I'm Not waiting. as a response to Jody, by the way, <laughs> whom we think is absolutely wonderful. Yeah.